Three, two, one. The year is 3117, and humanity is challenged once again with finding land on which to settle. After the environmental catastrophe that almost ended life for all mammals back in the 2080s, scientists finally beat out the religions and politicians to become the authority on all things environment and weather. The Consortium of Scientists was created in 2093 from the brightest minds the world had to offer, stretching across all industries. Their suggestions often led to new laws worldwide, and ever since the consortium, humans have worked in unison to heal the earth with all countries pitching in. Yes, all countries, no matter how small a part they could afford to play. In the 2170s, scientific advancements finally made mining other entities in the solar system profitable. Industries like asteroid extraction and extraplanetary habitat construction became the forefront of science, which was important due to the overpopulation Earth was suffering. There just weren't many ways left to counter the effects of a growing population of 37 billion people. The science was running out. Leaving Earth was the only way. So we shifted global efforts to inhabiting Mars, which held over 5 million cubic kilometers of accessible ice at its poles, or enough to cover the whole planet with 35 meters of water. By 2250, Mars had over a million residents. Unassisted cold fusion finally became a reality in 2486, revolutionizing the energy sector. All prior fusion needed energy input to sustain any output. The breakthrough happened when scientists in Australia encapsulated a reactor of dark matter, intensifying the reaction by a factor of 23. This eliminated the final remnants of nuclear power within a couple of decades. Cold fusion also made it possible to reintroduce a magnetosphere for Mars, protecting it from the sun's radiation. And without the barrage of solar particles, an atmosphere was created. Plants were introduced to the air, and Martian ponds and lakes were created. Mars was terraformed into a living planet, and everything was humming along smoothly until 2723, when it was announced that Mars, too, was running out of room for more people. Mars's surface is only 38% of Earth's, greatly reducing its capacity. So the Earth and Mars Planetary Coalition set out to create colonies in the asteroid belt, where plenty of solid material existed on which to build. This ended any need for more land, so to speak. But still, our species didn't fare as well on the asteroids with their minimal gravity and unpredictable proximitous events. There was no soil to plant, no rivers to wade in, no air to breathe, no land that one could really walk on untethered unless you were living on Ceres. Sadly, the search for soil and water was over, and so humans settled in. But in 2851, everything changed. Scientists studying objects in the Kuiper Belt received an anomaly reading from one of their ship's sensors. The scanners detected an immense gravitational field, but with no mass. Scientific curiosity got the better of them when they flew over to take a closer look and became ensnared in the anomaly's gravitational pull. They were never seen again. Until 19 years later, when the scientists returned and reported being sucked into what they could only describe as a wormhole, proven mathematically by Einstein himself, but never witnessed. After a short time of travel through the anomaly, the scientists ended up in a different solar system. They described it as having two stars, one yellow, the other blue. Thousands of planets revolved around the stars in a circumbinary orbit, creating stunning and varied skies. All planets were roughly the same size, with enough density to match Earth's gravity, and residing in or near the Goldilocks zone. And most importantly, their magnetospheres were intact. The missing scientists claimed they returned a year later when the wormhole reappeared, but what was clearly a year for them became 19 years on Earth. While in the binary star system beyond, the Moon scientists set out all the sensors they had to recover as much information as possible on the little planets while they awaited the wormhole's return. Some of the planets were closer to a star and had a more heated landscape, while others were further away and more covered with ice. Crucially, they all had nitrogen and oxygen levels close enough to Earth's to become more easily altered for human settlement. Some had water and plants already, and many were bare. They just needed to stock them with some familiar wildlife. Upon hearing all this, the Coalition set out to research the wormhole on its planets every 19 years. They worked on tweaking the air to make each of them habitable. They set up houses for each planet and landscaped as well. And once the new homes were ready, the Coalition began the selection process for their first set of inhabitants, the Founders. The ones that would begin the process of settling the new celestial objects as owners. Those who truly wanted to be part of the expansion of humanity into a new existence. 
into a new solar system they named Dawn. It was called Project Planet Me. There were those with the powerful connections necessary to put themselves first on the list for planetary acquisition. Others won contests and some were picked by lottery. These select and not so select few would be their new owners and proprietors of their very own planets. They needed only pay for the license and the gas fee to get there. Those chosen were told that each celestial sphere was fashioned with one house. It had a random color, windows, and scenery. In trying to make the new residents feel more at home, some houses were granted flowers, trees, or bushes. Others had fences, and some were bare. Other than the houses sharing the same architecture, there was no uniform way that they set up each abode, as the race was on to further the reaches of the human civilization. And they had only every 19 years to perform their magic. And this is where we find you, in 3117, waking up from your sleep-induced journey to the Kuiper Belt, through the wormhole, and arriving at dawn. In your encapsulating sleeping chamber, you open your eyes and blink a few times as they adjust to the dim blue lights. You take a deep breath, relieved to be awake and yet unsure as how things will go. As you exhale, a slight hiss enters your chamber as it slides out of an enclosure like a drawer. Then the hard, clear shield above your body slides away, letting in the stale smell of recycled air. After a moment of pause, you move your eyes about and notice you're wearing a great jumpsuit with light boots. You can also see other stoled sleeping chambers set in rows all around you. You tense a few muscles to make sure you have full movement before you decide to sit up. Placing your feet on the metal floor with a pair of thuds, you gaze around and see a long room spanning roughly 50 meters in either direction. Yep, this is the room I came in on, you think. With a bitter relief from the familiarity, you hear another hiss echo far down the room as a random drawer opens. With a smile of realization, you remember that today is the day you pick your first planet. A worthy moment, and exciting after all the wait. As the anticipation begins to well up within you like butterflies tumbling through your stomach, you stand up to stretch and see a door labeled, This Way. You walk over, and the door is open as you approach. Number 18? You hear in your ear the number you are in line to get your planet. Remembering the earpiece, you respond, Uh, yes. Arcana? You remember Arcana, the planetary curator, the AI entity that announces most of the information to the public? Correct. Number 18. Pretty good number. Thanks, you reply. Why is that? As the number of planets available declines and time goes on, the price for them will surely go up. It is inevitable. And we really want people who are passionate about this place. And being number 18 says a lot. Good point. Either way, getting in early and being a pioneer is greatly appreciated. Sounds like he means it. So thank you. Really. I'm happy to be a part of it all, you say truthfully. Please proceed to the left. You walk down the corridor lined with more doors leading to other hibernation rooms. As a reminder, everything you need to get started will be on your planet and we will have ships staying in the solar system to provide any assistance or expertise needed. And of course, you can purchase another planet if you so choose, or sell yours. It's up to you. The long corridor comes to an open elevator. You step in and watch the doors close as you turn to face them. And we have no idea which planet we'll get? You ask. The elevator opens and you see a few floating screens and a bright green button hovering just ahead. It is completely random, he says. There are 11 different planetary colors, something to do with solar reflection and soil makeup. The color of your house, the landscaping, the sky, the scenery, all random. You can have a nebula or some stars, bare land or a waterfall. Let's shoot for the waterfall, yeah? He chuckles. I'm rooting for you. And there are also some very rare planets that seem to live in a connected void. Some in the clouds, others underwater or in outer space. It's really fascinating. Sounds forlorn, as if he wished to have such a planet for himself. If you happen to get one, I'd love to see it. They're very rare and valuable. None so far, though. I'm only number 18, you quickly say to cheer him up. Now even more intrigued. There's a long way to go, and I'm sure anyone who gets a rare planet would love to show you, or anyone else who wants to take a look. I hope so, he says, and then gets back to business. Now, whichever celestial body you end up with will be called Planet Me number 18. You can call it whatever you wish, but to communicate with us, Planet Me number 18. Got it? Got it. Are you ready? I sure am.
and step forward and press the button. Here goes.